Good morning, everybody. So this last question to Agato was a perfect introduction to my talk because I'm going to talk about Bayesian methods uh, in general and uh, I will show I will show two particular examples. So and uh, before I even begin to explain about the project, uh, again, as an answer to that question, uh, deep uh, neural networks or just neural networks are such a popular tool, but of course they fail to quantify uncertainty in the way that Bayesian methods are able to do. And this is what my talk is about today. Um, so, my name is Lisa and uh, my background is in Bayesian inference and epidemiology. A bit less than a year ago, I have moved to Cambridge, UK to do a postdoc at AstraZeneca and I'm collaborating with safety biologists as well as, uh, as, well as with the company Prioris AI. So today I would like to present just one of the projects and if you have any questions about this project or anything else that I'm doing beyond that, please uh, feel free to find me later. So today I'm going to talk about drug-induced liver injury and this is a, a huge problem for drug development because uh, a lot of attrition is happening due, uh, due to generally toxicity, in particular um, drug induced liver injury and reasons of uh, of that injury can, uh, are quite versatile um, some of them of course are uh, just due to the wrong dosage I'm not talking about this today I'm rather talking about long-term effects and uh, they might be of uh, multi multi-mechanistic nature in some cases um, there is a blockage of bile, so bile is unable to uh, leave uh, liver cells, hepatocytes, or sometimes this is due to immune response and uh, genetic makeup of the host. And uh, due to all those reasons, predicting clinical toxicity preclinically is a very difficult task. That's why we collaborate with safety biologists. They are developing assays that they can run in the lab in vitro. And our task is to be able to pick up a signal already at this very early stage to predict what will happen to the patients in the clinic. It has been um, a long, uh, long-term practice that animal studies uh, were serving this purpose. So the toxicity was first explored on, in, is still nowadays explored on animals, but some study, um, and there is a citation, uh, some a, a number of studies actually, so I only put one citation if you want to uh, know more, just reach out. So the studies show that clinical uh, uh, excuse me, so results on animals do not always translate into humans. As this paper states, in 45% of cases, this is not the case. This is why we need to build in silico predictable models. And again, since we are uh, talking about clinical results, collecting clinical data about toxicity is not easy and it takes a long period of time. So the data sets that we are able to compile are very timid. So this is small data. This means that classical machine learning or statistical methods would uh, fail or their res results would be not robust and this is where Bayesian methods can help. As I mentioned and uh, as we all have heard on this conference, neural networks nowadays are applied in a wide variety of fields because they're very flexible and they're able to approximate highly nonlinear functions. And uh, also they have been already used for prediction of drug-induced li uh, liver injury. For instance, there was a competition called DOX21 where a number of teams were competing in uh, making best predictions. And the winning team actually has constructed a neural network. However, as we said in real life, when we work with particular data sets, those data sets are small. And first of all, such methods as classical neural networks would not be able to, um, to uh, perform inference in a robust way just because the amount of data is insufficient. But secondly, the predictions of those classical methods do not provide extended information about the uncertainty referring to the previous talk. This is where Bayesian neural networks help. 
So in general, what are the Bayesian methods? These are the methods where, except for the observed data, which we can model via likelihood, we use also prior information. And this prior information might include our knowledge about certain parameters, their values. Or this could be also our understanding of the process, be it my uh, biological process and our understanding of the mechanics of it, or be it a physical system. And this could be all easily incorporated into the Bayesian generative model. So like any Bayesian model, Bayesian neural networks describe each of its parameters not as point estimates and in best case uh, confidence intervals, rather each parameter is described as a distribution. Some other advantages of Bayesian framework is that they help us to prevent overfitting. And uh, we have a small example in one of the citations that, uh, uh, that I will mention now in, the, uh, in this presentation. And as well, they provide very rich, uh, so they provide information about uncertainty in a very rich form. Here is uh, the project that I've been working on for the last couple of months. And for demonstration purposes, I've used publicly available data so we all can access it. This was published by Pfizer just in December this year. And we're looking at a data set where labels are present and um, the outcome is, or, uh, is of ordered categorical type. So you see the coding green or one is uh, there was no daily concern, yellow is uh, less daily concern, and third are the most toxic drugs, most daily concern. So I created a split of the data and um, the inputs of the model are the physical chemical properties of compounds. And these are the assays that safety biologists run anyways on all the drug candidates in the lab. Um, how the model works, um, we compute an underlying latent predictor, which is being calculated on the continuous scale. And then by putting, uh, by assigning two thresholds, um, which allow us to understand uh, what's, uh, what's um, where is the borderline between toxic and non uh, toxic, middle, uh, moderately toxic, and non toxic compounds? Then we are able to predict for each drug individually which one of them belongs to which category. So, if uh, you would like to talk about the technical side of it, um, then please I would find me later. So, I've implemented the model in the language called Julia and probabilistic modeling language called Turing. As a baseline, I used the model uh, that we published also last December. This was a very simple model, the proportional odds logistic regression. Just think about it as a logistic regression where the outcome is uh, not just the priority, uh, excuse me, not the probability, but rather um, this probability is being presented in this prioritized manner. So we put those two thresholds onto the latent continuous variable to distinguish between three categories, one, two, three. There was some non-linearity involved into this model, which was just the interaction between the input features, and it proved to work fairly well. But still, as it turned out, Bayesian neural network can do better. So what's the difference between this and the previous model? There is no interaction between the predictors that we start with. Instead, I've plugged in this one hidden layer. And as I mentioned before, all the weights and biases, unlike in a classical neural network, they're now described by distributions. Moreover, um, the variance of that distribution is not set, so it's not a person, a user, a modeler who is defining what the variance is. The variance is being inferred from data. Same as the two thresholds which I demos uh, demonstrated earlier, those which separate uh, our continuous predictor into categories, those two thresholds are inferred from data as well. Now getting a bit into technical details, of course, once we have several models to compare, we need to have different evaluation measures. And once we work in, in the Bayesian setting, um, 
there is a tradition, of course, of using information criterion, but also uh, on, in this setting where our prediction is so much richer than just saying what is the predicted category one to three. Imagine if we are trying to predict categories from one to three and our continuous predictor is a continuous number representing category two, but is it closer to category one or to category three? So if our prediction lies in the range describing category two, but the true label is one, even though within the range for category two, the continuous predictor is closer to category three, we are far off from the true label. So to be able to take this information into account, otherwise, what's the point of doing all the complex modeling? We need to also introduce relevant metrics. And uh, Bria score is such a metric that's being used for binary data when we model just probability of event to happen when the outcomes and labels are just zero and one. So I introduced this order Bria score. It does, uh, it does exist in as a um, as something that people talk to, but there are no publications rigorously describing what is it. So I've just described what is it. This is such, such a metric that allows us to understand how far is the continuous predictor from the true label. Bria skill score is another point of view on the same question. It just allows us to understand how better is the model we're making than the baseline model. And as the baseline model, we can choose either model that predicts always the category with the highest frequency or which predicts just the observed frequency of the three groups. And um, balance the accuracy as we would normally do. Here's a table which is probably hard to understand, but I will talk us through. So when we look at the first metric, that is the information criteria, we tend to choose the model with the lowest information criteria. In this case, the Bayesian neural network wins the ordered logistic regression. For the Bayes score, uh, we want this continuous number to be as close to the true label as possible. That's why the smaller the number, the better. And we see the numbers are smaller again for the BNN. And the Bria skill score, um, we want it to be higher, which means that our prediction is closer to the to what we actually observe than the baseline model. And we see again. Bria score, uh, Bria skill score is better for the BNN. And um, coming back to more classical metrics, excuse me. Um, as we saw, so I forgot to mention that in, in the literature on this topic on prediction of toxicity and in particular uh, liver injury, the standard is 70%. So once you are able to achieve the accuracy of 70%, this is just as well as we can do nowadays. So the proportional odds logistic regression is not too close to this number, while the BNN makes us quite satisfied with the results. Now looking at all the predictions overall, where on the x-axis is the true label, the category, and on the y-axis is this latent variable, we can see that the BNN model is able to distinguish classes much sharper than the first model is able to do. So for instance, categories two and three tend to overlap for the ordered logistic regression much more than they do for a BNN. Since we work with safety biologists, all we want to see are the posterior plots, which for them uh, provide information about the profile of the toxicity of a certain compound. So looking at the folic acid, what the first model can do versus what the second model can do, and we know that the true class is one means folic acid, uh, folic acid is safe. To summarize this work, um, the new model does do better than a previous model, even though already uh, the previous model that we've published was a great step ahead. And uh, to my knowledge, this is the first application of Bayesian neural networks to toxicity. 
This model is quite simple, but already our safety biologists are relying on it to progress and rank their compounds. So there are reasons to believe that this work will expand. Also, we currently don't have a team lead in our group. In case someone is interested, please email to this person. Thank you very much. And as I said, please feel free to find me later. I'm happy to talk about this and any other work I'm doing at the moment. So the question was how many parameters there is in the Bayesian neural network and how did I calculate the posterior? So the total number of parameters is 150, which includes all the weights and biases together. And how did I calculate the posterior? So I started with a prior for each of, uh, for each of the parameters. Then I calculated the likelihood, which is uh, the ordered, uh, ordered distribution, ordered categorical distribution. When I started, it did not exist actually in this language during, so I had to contribute uh, to their, so, uh, their, their source code as well. And um, we start from the input features, same as we do in a neural network, and we progress them forward. And uh, in the end, the likelihood, which is ordered logistic, regression first case and uh, ordered categorical likelihood in the second case. We again propagate it forward, but not in the optimization sense, rather in the Markov chain Monte Carlo sense. So we're performing Bayesian inference. Uh, 